because this looks like a stop, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, so any questions? So we discussed the, the yeah, the mm, SU2 Lie algebra, right, last time? That's where we stopped. Yeah, so the... Also, safe is teaching sometimes, right? Safe and Atish <coughs> do yeah. much more than me, right? Okay, so uh, to uh, yeah, so the SU two Lie algebra we discussed last time, uh, SU two the the Lie algebra of SU two. So just to uh, a notational uh, Lie algebra. Of SU2. Uh, when I use the capital letters, capital SU, that will be denote that will denote the group, huh? and uh, just to distinguish between the two things. Huh? And the uh, Lie algebra will be uh, will use small. Uh, okay, I don't know. Let's say SU2. Huh? So this will mean it's a Lie algebra. Just to distinguish between the two things. This is not a vector space. This is a vector space. Huh? Okay, in fact, we we already saw that the SU2. Was the parameters of SU2 uh, was, was on S3, three dimensional sphere, right? Mm -hmm. Three dimensional sphere is certainly not a vector space. You cannot add two, two uh, vectors of the, of the S3, you will go out to the S3, right? But this is a vector space. Um, it, it's a three dimensional vector space, so the dimension is three. The dimension is, of course, the equal to the number of parameters. So dimension of SU2. Because you can, to get the Lie algebra gen generators, you just take derivatives with respect to the parameters, no? Near the identity. So if you have three parameters, then you have three generators. So, so the dimension is the same. But what was very interesting, and in fact we found the generators were, uh, the generators were, I mean, one basis for the generators. Uh, so a basis, let's say a basis, for the generators, uh, you could choose them to be polynomials. Sigma a. I think we always had an i there, right? We put an i there. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's a matter. As I said again, uh, you know, most of the physicists would not put an i there, okay? Uh, because the physicists like to think it as Hermitian matrices. With the i sigma a, it becomes anti-Hermitian. But it doesn't matter. In fact, later on, uh, when we discuss representations. I will uh, remove the eyes to, to make the, make it Hermitian because it's easier to discuss representations. But this is just a matter of multiplying or not multiplying by i. Okay. So you have uh, i uh, sigma a, and um, uh, okay. Uh, so these are the poly matrices. So what this means the basis? The basis means that any generator. So any generator, this is a vector space, so if, of course you can add. No? So any generator can be written as some xa uh, times this generator, which is i sigma a. Did I put also a half there? Probably not. Huh? I mean, it's a matter of, you can choose any basis. No? In three-dimensional, anything which uh, forms a basis. You know the definition of basis, right? Yeah. A set of linearly independent vectors because then you can express any other vector as a linear combination of these three. So you can, you are free to choose whatever. So just, uh, okay, sigma a. And um, so this will be the arbitrary vector, arbitrary, arbitrary element of, of, uh, of, of SU2. 
will be given by that for arbitrary choices of Xa. Xa is a real because we are always going to take this to be an anti Hermitian according to in, in, in our definition. Right? So Xa has to be real. Xa is a real. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, so this was of course a vector space, fine. But what was very important was the, the, the bracket structure. And that we saw the bracket structure was sigma A, sigma B, the commutator was 2i epsilon a b c sigma c. Okay. So if you want to put an i there, i i, uh, and uh, here you put an i. So i square is minus. So it should be. Uh, so it becomes minus. So this i then goes out here. Right. So. So there is this algebra structure. Okay. So, Okay, and uh, in fact, we can uh, do a bit more. Um, we can do a bit more in the sigma. We can just, uh, after all, these are two by two matrices, so I can just multiply the two, right? And this, uh, two by two matrices, I can multiply and see what you get. You will get identity times delta AB, identity matrix. This is a two by two identity matrix, plus I epsilon ABC. Right? This uh, you are familiar with that. Right? If, if not, you can just check it explicitly. The, the three poly matrices were uh, it was to, uh, sigma a, sigma one was zero, one times zero. Sigma two was zero minus i i zero, and sigma three was uh, one zero zero minus one. So this was the point. And you can just explicitly just multi do a matrix multiplication and check that uh, <coughs> you get that. Of course, the product itself does not make sense inside the Lie algebra, right? Because identity is not an element of the Lie algebra, Lie algebra not in the SU2 Lie algebra, right? SU2 Lie algebra, but this, all the Hermitian, anti Hermitian matrices, two by two matrices, but also traceless, right? Where an identity is not traceless, it is trace is not zero. So this guy is not part of the not part of the of SU2 the algebra. Right? But these are. So but of course you don't expect that. I mean uh, what, what the statement here is that only the bracket, this commutator between any two elements of the Lie algebra goes to the Lie algebra. Right? So it's only the commutator. So if I call X, uh, let me call this uh, this guy S capital X. And similarly, another uh, y, which is the uh, y a i sigma a, if I take a completely arbitrary two generators, sub generators, then the commutator of x with y will again be in SU2. Okay. <coughs> that uh, one, can, one can see. I mean, one can prove in general without even necessarily using this uh, expansion because. Uh, uh, we, we, we already said that X and Y are anti Hermitians matrices. So if you take the, let, let's see whether this is, the result is again anti Hermitian or not, right? So if it belongs to SU2, we need to check that this is anti Hermitian and also it is traceless. There are two conditions we need to check. So let's look at the, take the dagger of that. Okay. But that's the same, well, uh, XY commutator is XY minus YX. Dagger, which is the same as uh, if I look at the first term, so you'll get here y dagger x dagger, right? And when you take the dagger, it changes. And then second term would be again minus x dagger y dagger. Each of them is anti Hermitian, so there's a minus sign here, a minus sign here, it remains plus. Okay. So you get here y x minus x y, but that's nothing else but the I, minus commutator of x y. So the dagger of this guy is minus. So this is the anti hermitian That's the first thing. Secondly, the trace, trace of any commutator is zero because uh, the, the trace of uh, x, y 
is the same as, uh, by definition, is a trace of xy minus a trace of yx, right? But trace is cyclic, so I can move this y there and cancel, so you get zero. Right? So this is indeed it belongs to SU2, right? But the product, when I just take the product, that that is not, uh, you know, there is no reason why it should be part of the Lie algebra. Okay. So this is fine. But nevertheless, I can still compute it. Okay. It will not be part of the Lie algebra, but okay, I have this relation. Right. That is fine. Now, using this, you can actually, uh, uh, you know, construct finite elements of the, the Lie algebra. Uh, finite elements of the group. And, and the way to do it is, these were like small uh, infinitesimal transformations, right? But you can exponentiate the infinitesimal transformation, and you can start getting finite elements. So to get that, to let, let's see how one would, one would do this. Just to, I think you have again seen it probably in, in some context in the quantum mechanics course. But uh, let's just try to do that. So you have, uh, let's exponentiate it, e to the power of i um, xa uh, sigma a. Suppose I do this. Okay. What we can do, it's actually more convenient. First, let me just do that, one of them. Just take x sigma 3. Okay. Let's just first try to do one, one of them. And then we can do more generally. Uh, some x, x3 sigma 3, let's say. If I exponentiate it, what does it mean exponential? It just means sum i x3, right, let me drop the 3, x sigma 3 to the power of n over factorial n, n going from 0 to infinity, right? That's a definition of the exponential. Yeah, I mean, this is, you may say, what is the meaning of exponential of a matrix? Well, this is a definition. So each of these is a matrix, same uh, two, two by two matrices, and then you just add them. So, so let's uh, uh, do that here. So this is the same. And now use the fact that sigma three square is one. Okay. So let's split this into even and odd terms, right? Let's split, let's split this, uh, write it in terms of uh, n uh, going from zero to infinity, i x sigma three to the power of 2n over factorial 2n, right? So this is the, uh, I've taken care of all the even numbers, even terms. And then there's an odd term, uh, there are odd terms which are, again, n going from 0 to infinity, i x sigma 3 to the power of 2n plus 1 divided by factorial 2n plus 1. Okay, so I just separated out even and odd. If this is the same as that. So all the even, even parts of the even values of n are this, and all the odd values of n are that. The reason for this split is that because sigma 3 squared is 1 uh, identity, one by one, uh, I mean it's a 2 by 2 matrix. So by 1, I mean 2 by 2 identity matrix. So here you see you get sigma 3 to the 2n. Okay. So therefore, this will be uh, simply sigma 3, you can forget about it, just identity. Okay. So you will just get sum over i x uh, to the power of 2n factorial 2n times identity matrix. And this one you will get uh, now 2n two, uh, two plus 1. Sigma 3 to the 2n is 1. Then you just get one more sigma 3 left over. right? So you will get here i x uh, to the power of 2n plus 1 divided by 2n plus 1 factorial Again, and going from zero to infinity, and going from zero to infinity, but I have still one sigma three left over. And now this you recognize immediately. This is just uh, cosine x, right? I mean, uh, yeah. So this is, uh, yeah. So so first term is cosine x. I did this, this sum is nothing else but cosine of x. Okay. Uh, 
And the next term is uh, i sine x. So this is identity. And then here, i sine x sigma. You get this term. Because remember, sine, co co cosine x has an expansion, Taylor expansion, uh, 1 minus x squared over factorial 2 plus x to the 4 over uh, factorial 4, and so on. Yeah? That x alternate in signs comes because you have a i is there. i squared is minus, right? i to the 4 is plus, and so on. So that takes care of this signs here. And sine x is uh, x minus x cube over factorial 3 plus x to the 5 over factorial 4 and so on. Uh, 5, sorry, x to the 5 and so on. Okay. So that will be this here. But there is one i, if you look at the n equal to 0 term, you have a i x. So that one i comes out. And the others, i squared, i to the 4, etc. will be plus or minus signs, huh? which gives you this relative signs here. So that's why you get an overall i. So this is nothing else. Uh, as, a, as a matrix, it is cosine x, i sine x, uh, minus, uh, sorry, cosine x plus, so this is e to the i x, this is sigma 3, and this is e, minor, e to the minus i x, 0, 0. Okay? Because this is both are diagonal. So in the, uh, sigma 3 is 1 minus 1, this is 1, 1, so the top component becomes cos x plus i sine x, and the bottom component becomes cos x minus i sine because remember, this is this is 1, minus 1, 0, 0, and this is 1, 1, 0, 0. So you see, just add the two matrices, you get e to the i x and e to the minus x. Yeah. This, this was, remember, the general parameterization was z1, z2, z1 bar, z2 bar, and z1 bar, right? Subject to the condition that z1, z1 bar, plus z2, z2 bar, was equal to 1. Okay. So this is a particular case where z2 is 0. Okay. And z1, z1 bar equal to 1 means z1 is a pure phase. So that's, that's what I see. Now, more generally, uh, you can, uh, so this was only if I, I turn on only one of them. But let's suppose it is, it is uh, uh, I mean, x a sigma a. So I just do the same thing, now for an arbitrary element. Before I just took, for simplicity, I took only third direction. But now I take everything. So all of this you can of course do. I uh, x a sigma a and x a sigma a. Now, this part is fine. But now, again, use the fact, so let's just take the multiplication of the two. So we use the, now, x a sigma a times x a sigma a, right? If I want x b sigma b, if I want to take the square of this. So let's take the n equal to 1 term. So there will be a term like x dot sigma times x dot sigma, correct? So it will be this here. And now I use the fact, this the, the product rule, sigma a times sigma, so this is the same as x a x b times sigma a sigma b, which were, had two terms, delta a b times the identity. Okay, plus i epsilon a b c uh, 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 sigma c. But that epsilon a b c drops out from here because x a x b x a when it is, this is anti-symmetric, but this is symmetric. Okay, so this drops out, and you are just left. With that. So this part is again the same. The only difference here, so th this becomes x, uh, so this becomes uh, x a, x a, uh, so the, or, uh, yeah, because delta a b term will give you x a, x a, so x a, x a uh, times, uh, um, so minus, because i square, I've taken i square, and then this becomes n. Okay. So that's the first term. And here again, I can split this into 2n plus 1. I can remove the 2n part. Then there will be left over is i x x a sigma a. That will be one term which will be left over. And for the remaining part, I have the same thing here. So 
this will be minus x x x x mod square. Let's say x mod square to the power of n. Okay. X mod square meaning length square of the vector x. X is real, of course, but the length square. Right. So once again, I can write this in terms of cosine and sine. So the first term is cosine of uh, of the of the length. Huh? Uh, what shall I call? It? Uh, let, let's call x x. What shall I call it? Uh, suppose I write uh, for, uh, usually you might have seen this. X a is some unit vector n a. Okay. Unit vector times some length, which I'll let me call it theta. That's easier to write because then x a x square, x x a x a is nothing else but theta square. N is a unit vector. So n a n a summed over a is one. So I'm taking unit vector. So this way in this notation it becomes much easier. This becomes simply minus theta square. Theta square is a length x a x a. Similarly, here also becomes theta square. And this guy becomes uh, the, the, the finally the last one left over piece will become n a times theta. I mean, this was odd, right? Odd term. So two n of the guys we just use this this, this part. Okay. But then the one of them is left over. But that one of, one of them is left over was x a sigma sigma a. But we are using this notation, I mean this uh, definition. Xa is some the length of the Xa times the unit vector. So that's. So again, we get cos theta. So we get uh, the first term is simply cosine theta times the identity matrix plus uh, I sine theta times an A. That's right? Is, is, there, is it clear? I mean, or am I, am I? I mean, this theta together with that makes it theta to the two n plus one, right? And this minus sign just gives you alternate uh, the, this kind of this signs here, alternate signs. So you just get sine theta, but that that's multiplying this matrix, which is I n is. So this is it. Now if I write it in terms of matrix, you'll get here cos theta uh, plus i sine theta n3, third direction. Here you will get uh, uh, i sine theta uh, n1, n1 minus i n2. And here you get uh, i sine theta n1 plus i n2 and here cos theta minus i sine theta n3. The, the sigma 1, I just use this, those polymetries, sigma 1 and sigma 2. So again, call this as z1. Uh, then this is obviously compressed conjugate, z1 bar. If you call this uh, z2, then this is z2 bar because there's a i mi minus z2 bar. Oh, did I write? It's a minus z2 bar. Uh, this this is the compressed conjugate of that, but there's an extra i here, so this is nothing else but minus z2 bar, and that is the general. That is a form of the general S2 matrix. And indeed, you can check the length squares. So if you take the lengths, so z1, z1 bar is gives you cos square theta plus sine square theta times n3 square, right? So let's take uh, the, this, this compute this here. So z1, z1 bar, if you call this as z1, is uh, cos square theta plus sine square theta times n3 square. And now take the z2 times z2 bar. 
So this I square, I square, uh, I mean, this is a minus, right? So Z2, Z2 bar is this times a minus of that. Okay. So I times minus I is plus one. So again, you get sine square theta. And then you'll get this times that, but that will give me N1 hat square plus N2 hat square. There's an I and minus I. So it will give you N1 hat square plus N2 hat square. So sine square theta comes with N1 hat square plus N2 hat square plus N3 hat square, but that is 1. So you get cos square theta plus sine square theta, which is 1. So you need this sign. That, that is, of course, that, that was, uh, I mean, we didn't have to really check it because what we are doing is uh, we are ex uh, taking the uh, exponentiate, exponentiating a traceless matrix. So determinant is going to be 1, right? That is what we did discuss yesterday with this trick of uh, uh, writing the determinant as uh, exponential of trace log, right? And that is how we found that it should be traceless. I mean, the, you know, so it, that, that's not surprising. But in any case, it's good to check it you know, once you get the results. Because that condition, this condition was simply determinant equal to 1, right? Z1, Z1 bar plus Z2, Z2 bar equal to 1. Okay, so this is the way to, uh, this, this, I mean, this is just, I wanted to give an example because here we have a sufficiently simple matrices. Generators are very, very simple for two, SU2. Right? So it's easy to actually exponentiate it. And act, get, I mean, you can, of course, write exponential for anything. But in this case, you can actually calculate in a, in a very compact way. You can compute it. And uh, you get finite group. OK. Uh, any questions on this? Uh, because after that, now, now my next topic will be SO3. And in particular, how I relate this, uh, is there a connection between SU2 and SO3? Both are three-dimensional. SU2 is three-dimensional. SO, SO3, we already, I think we discussed before, right? In one of the previous lectures. That SO3, dimension of SO3 is also three, right? Uh, so the, as, a lead, uh, as a vector space, both the, infin the, lead, the infinitesimal generators will both be three-dimensional. So if the two vector spaces are the same dimension, they are isomorphic. But the problem is the, the bracket structure. You know, is, is bracket structure could be something different. You know? So one needs to also check. This is somebody's. Ah, okay. Maybe one should give it, uh, maybe after the lecture, we should give it to Patricia. Okay, so so let's see how do we how we proceed with this here. Mm -hmm. But before that, let me just uh, also mention. Uh, although this will be discussed in much more detail later, this will be probably the beginning, the first lecture next week. Next week. But let me just mention one thing: uh, a representation of either the group, or Lie group, or Lie group. So what do we mean by representation? A representation. So suppose I'm given a group G. So we can discuss the representation both at the level of group or at the level of Lie algebra. So let's discuss at the level of group G. So this representation means it's a map from the G to some set of matrices. Set of matrices. Let's uh, say of some fixed, uh, fixed uh, time. Huh? Uh, let's say say n cross n. So square matrices of some dimensionality, n cross n matrices. N is arbitrary at this stage. Hmm? N could be anything. So it's a map. Uh, but most importantly, what one should what one should ensure is that this map preserves the group composition rule. Okay. That's the most important. The most important thing about the group is not just that it's just a space, but that it has this composition rule, right? That's what makes it group. 
I mean, that composition rules have to satisfy some conditions, right? And that's why you, when you, when you, when that is when you say it's a group, right? So this map uh, should preserve, map should preserve the group multiplication, group composition rules. Composition rule. Okay. So what do I mean by group composition rule? Here I have some rule, group composition rule. Huh? Now this is a set of matrices. So here I have the comp I have to also define what is the composition rule here. So I will always take the composition rule here to be simply matrix multiplication. Okay. So here the composition will be simply a matrix multiplication. So two and two and by n matrices multiply. Yeah? Matrix multiplication. That is in this this space. So what that means is that let's suppose I take two elements, G1 and G. Well, G1 will be mapped to some matrix. Let me call it M. M is a matrix, okay? Which will of course depend on which particular matrix will of course depend on G1 uh, the, on the element here. So I indicate that by putting this is a function of G, right? So, and similarly, G2 will go to some matrix G, M of G2, right? Now, what I want to ensure is M, uh, G, uh, G1 times G2, the, this is the, the composition rule, whatever the composition rule you have in the G, this is again going to be another element of the, of the group. So this will also be mapped to some matrix, right? This will be mapped to M of G1, G2. Of course, this is fine. But what I now demand when I say what is that should preserve the composition rule, it means that this must be equal to M G1 times M G2, where this is usual matrix multiplication. So this is what I mean. I mean, this is of course guaranteed. The, the given a map, when I say map, that means for every element here goes to some element there, right? So G1 goes to some element here, G2 goes to some element there. So G1 times G2 is again something here, some element here. So it will go to some element there. The non-trivial thing that we are demanding is that this is not something arbitrary. Okay? This has to be the product of these two guys, where the product is a usual multiplication. Okay? So that's what we are saying. So uh, pictorially, uh, what I mean, just to think in terms of picture, so I have uh, the, the space, the group here, and here let's say the set of matrices. Matrices. Now G1 is some point here, and G2 is some point here. So G1 is mapped, say there, and G2 is mapped there. Okay. Now G1 times G2 will be some element. This is say G1 times G2. Okay. This is mapped there, some point here. Then what we are saying is that. See, this is a composition, so this times that is this, but he, here using the group composition rule. Okay? Then the, when you say th this is preserved, it means this times that is equal to that as a matrix multiplication. Okay? There are very strong condition. If you didn't have this condition, you could have just chosen arbitrary maps. You know? But this is a very important condition. This is the most important part of it, that it, it preserves. It preserves the group multiplication structure. So of course, this immediately implies that the identity, identity element here, should be mapped to the identity element there, right? Because identity times any of the group element is it's, it, itself. So it better be also that the identity here times anything here, the, the the object to which identity is mapped, that times any other guy should be again the other guy, no? So it should be identity, and also the inverse. If G is mapped to, uh, if G1 is mapped to M G1, then G1 inverse should be mapped to M inverse. I mean inverse of that, right? So, so these are some of the consequences of this, right? Uh, but more, more generally, this is the condition we need to satisfy. What did I say? This is not equal. I mean, this is going to. This is mapped. So that's the uh, property here. 
at the, at the level of, the, uh, you can also talk about uh, representations. So here is a representation uh, at the level of uh, group. Uh, you can also then talk about the representation of the Lie algebra. Uh, the, so again, a map of the Lie algebra to the set of matrices. So uh, similarly, you can talk about the Lie algebra. Uh, now, what should I use the notation? Uh, I'm using this capital G for the group. Huh? So maybe just to distinguish between the Lie algebra. So I will use this, this curly script, huh? G. So this will be the Lie algebra. So this is a vector space with the bracket structure. So this is again mapped to some set of matrices. So let's say again n by n for some n right? square matrices. So, uh, so now here the elements are vectors because there's a vector space. So let's say x is mapped to m of x and uh, y is mapped to uh, m of y. Okay. Then first of all, it should preserve the vector space structure. Okay. Both are vector spaces. Right? Vector, the matrices are vector space in the usual uh, addition of matrices. Addition and multiplication by numbers. So, so in other words, if I am given two matrices M1 and M2, both are n by n, then it makes sense to talk about A times M1 plus B times M2. This is again another matrix where A and B are real numbers or complex numbers depending on whether these matrices were real matrices or complex matrices. So, so this will be a vector space. And the identity of the addition is, of course, the zero matrix. Right? Just like zero is the, for the real numbers, zero is the, for another addition, zero is identity. Right? Zero plus anything is the same thing. So, so this is a vector space. So it should satisfy the vector space structure. Okay. That basically means that this is a linear map. Okay. This is a linear map. So in other words, uh, if I take M of AX plus BY, Okay. Then it should be equal to A of Mx plus B of M1. Okay. That is just a so it's a linear map from one vector space to another vector space, okay. which satisfies this condition. Uh, but then also you have a bracket structure uh, here. Yeah. Is this the, the normal addition? Normal addition, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a vector space, so you can add. Now, remember, like SU2, uh, this was just, uh, for SU2 example, this was a set of all anti hermitian matrices, right? So you can multiply any anti hermitian matrix with a real number. It will again be an anti hermitian matrix, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can add the two such matrices, it will again be anti hermitian So that was a vector space structure in SU2. Similarly, for all the Lie algebras, there will be a vector space structure. Uh, so we have this. Uh, so that's the structure here. The matrices. Uh, these are mapped to now some matrix and cross n matrices. Uh, polymatrices in SU two case, polymatrices themselves are two by two <coughs> matrix. But now I'm saying that uh, the set of matrices for any n, n doesn't have to be two, and can be anything. Uh, uh, but it should satisfy. It should preserve the vector space structure. That is uh, one thing. In a sense, you see, this is related to the, the fact that we are demanding at the level of group, the group composition rule, right? So in particular, uh, when I, suppose I take two, two, two group elements which are close to identity, and I multiply, yeah. right? Then the, the Lie algebra elements will become additive to the first order, right? I mean, if I take e to the power of x and e to the y, and just look at the first order, the, the infinitesimal. Hmm? Then this will be simply identity plus x plus y, plus higher orders, plus order x square or y square or x y, right? To the lowest order. So uh, when we say that uh, if g1 goes to uh, one element, one matrix, g2 goes to another matrix, g1 times g2 should go to the product of these two matrices, right? 
right? That's exactly like that. But now the product again, because this is close to identity, identity itself we said is mapped to the to the identity of the of the matrix, right? That we said that was necessary from the group to, to preserve the group composition rule. So now, if some element which is close to the identity will be mapped to some element which is close to this identity here. And there are two identities. This is the uh, the group identities. Right? Here is the in the matrix sense. There's a n. There's a n cross n identity matrix. Okay. So if I go somewhere near, I mean in the group space, this is a group space. I go. I take some element which is close to identity. Okay. So the up to first order in x. Then that should go close to the identity matrix here. So once again, this will be close to identity. Again, it will be some vector space there, right? So th this is the that. So here also it will be additive. You see, uh, if I take e to the x and e to the y, this is a, to the first order. It is one plus x plus y, right? Now x is mapped to something here. Y is mapped to something there. So x plus y should be mapped to the sum of the two matrices. So this is directly coming from that. But now we need also to ensure more things. Because as we said, the algebra is not just the, that's the vector space, there's also a bracket structure. Right? So we need to make sure that the bracket is also preserved. Okay? So what that means is is if x is mapped to m of x and y is mapped to m of y, then uh, the commutator of x, y is again an element of the Lie algebra. So this also, when, once you have defined the map from the Lie algebra to matrices, you have also defined that this goes to some, some particular matrix. right? So this will go to some matrix, which I did not, which according to this notation, it is simply x, y. So this is mapped to that matrix. But now what we want to make sure is that the commutation, the, this the algebra structure is preserved. What it means that this must be equal to the commutator of m of x with m of y. So again, the picture was the same. I mean, I here x space, I mean the Lie algebra space, and here is a matrix space. So x, capital X is mapped there. Capital Y is mapped somewhere here. Okay. The commutator x, y is some point here, some, some guy. This will be mapped again some point here. But then what we want to make, just like, okay, the, this, this, this object was not, it was obtained given this, right, by commutator. So we should also obtain this guy as a commutator of these two matrices, okay? Where now the commutation relation is just with the usual matrix multiplication. So this means mx times my minus my times mx by using matrix multiplication groups. So that is what. So if you can find such a map, then you say it is a representation of the corresponding group or the Lie algebra. Now that is of course very important for us, for, for physicists particularly, because the moment you realize it as a matrix, then you can think of it as a transformation on some space, right? Because any n cross n matrix can be thought of as a transformation, a linear transformation on an n dimensional vector space, right? Because you can take these matrices and let them act on an n dimensional vector space, I mean some column vector x1 up to xn. So think of this as there's some space, n-dimensional space, and this matrix, this n by n matrices, will act as transformation. And uh, so in a particular physics application, this is the most important thing. I mean, you, you realize all these symmetries uh, as linear transformations on some space. So, so representations on that. Now, of course, the, we will spend a lot of time on uh, I mean, you already know from your quantum mechanics course that SU2, well, I don't know whether you did SU2, but it, certainly you did SO3, right? Rotation group, like when you did the hydrogen atom or uh, three-dimensional harmonic oscillators and so on, no? You did this uh, rotation group. And uh, using the rotation group, you had uh, you could simplify the question problem of uh, finding the eigenvalues, no? And so on. 
Uh, there was a symmetry group, SO3, and you remember there were spin uh, uh, angular momentum L states, right? Uh, for each L, there were it was 2L plus 1 dimensional representation because the J3 quantum number could go from minus L to plus L in the steps of 1. No? So there were 2L plus 1 dimensions. So that will be an example where you have a, two, a spin L representation would be a 2L plus 1 dimensional vector space. And what you're doing is you're, I said, you probably have, were not thinking in this language, maybe it was not presented like that. But what you are doing actually, we're just finding representations of the SO3 or SU2, right? A map from SU2 Lie algebra or SO3 Lie algebra to a 2L plus 1 times 2L plus 1 matrices. So you're finding the representation. So that is the, yeah. Uh, okay. Now, in general, of course, to find representations, uh, and that is what I'll spend a lot of time next week, to go through the uh, SU2 completely, huh? to construct all the finite dimensional representations, and show that these are all you have. I mean, the, what you have done already in the quantum mechanics course, that's all. I mean, there are no more finite dimensional representations. Okay. So I will go through that systematically by basically using the kind of, uh, like, uh, Creation and annihilation of the and so on. Using that language. Okay. Raising and lowering of the and so on. So we'll do that. But uh, uh, for all the Lie algebras, uh, for the higher dimension, it becomes higher Lie algebras, it becomes quite difficult. SU2 is quite simple. But uh, as you start going to SU3 and so on and so forth, it becomes much more difficult. Huh? And uh, the rest of the course, we'll be discussing that. Huh? How you do, in particular, SU3, I'll go into some more detail. And then towards the end, I will sketch how you can generalize to other things. But there are, so representations are not easy to find. But there are two representations which are kind of almost given to you. Okay. One of them, of course, uh, in these classical groups that we are talking about, there was a defining representation. Because after all, we talked about a C2 as a 2 by 2 matrices. So already you had poly matrices which were 2 by 2 matrices. right? So that is what is called the fundamental representation. It is a terminology. Fundamental means that, uh, that that is what was used to define the group, yeah? essentially. That. But there's another representation which also comes for free. You don't have to do any work. You, that al always exists. And that is what is called the adjoint representation. And I'll discuss adjoint representation. And we'll find that the adjoint representation of SU2 is in fact SO3. Okay? That, that's what we'll find. Right. So let, let's see. Um, there is an adjoint map, adjoint uh, action. Uh, so think about this. Uh, so I have this group space, okay, group, and here is my identity. Okay, this is the identity element. Now consider some uh, two elements, G one and G. Let's say, two elements. Huh? So. Uh, and I will take G to be infinitesimally close to the identity. Okay? G1 need not be. G1 can be anything. Okay? This G I take to be infinitesimally close. So what's going to happen? So this G will be somewhere nearby. I mean, I have to draw it. It's some, somewhere nearby, near the identity. So infinitesimally close to it. Okay? Now consider G1 times, uh, I don't know which order I write, we write here. It doesn't matter which order you write, but again, it just follows it. G, G inverse, let's say. So I take G1 inverse, G, G, okay. using the group composition. Okay. So G1 is some, need not be an infinitesimal element, it can be finite element. I mean, not close to identity. So the picture will be something like this. I, uh, G1 is somewhere here, let's say. Uh, so I, I, I have G1 here. Then I multiply it by G. So G is infinitesimally close to identity. So the result, whatever I will get, will be also very close to G1, right? Because identity times G1 would have been G1. So it's something close to identity. So that means that if I take the product, G with G1, it should be something close to. Then I multiply by G1 inverse. So I'm going to go somewhere back here, right? Because if I multiply G1 inverse here, I will get back to identity. So when I multiply by G1 inverse, I'm going to go back somewhere there. Okay. 
near mind. It should be also infinitesimally close to identity because indeed you can see that as G becomes one, this is, so when I say infinitesimal, I mean uh, think of G as some, uh, depending on some parameter, and then I just make a Taylor expansion, right? Uh, and take the first term, first term there. So since at theta equal to zero, this is identity, right? And so that G1 inverse times identity times G1 is identity. This guy, the result is also going to be somewhere close to that, right? That means that if I now expand it, expand this guy, G1 inverse, and let's write it as one identity plus uh, some small, so let's say in SU2 case, it would be like I XA sigma A, right? XA are some numbers. And then I forget, and then order X squared, but I forget. Uh, and then I multiply by G here. Well, this is going to be something, which will be again close to identity. It should be something like one plus I some Y A, not the same XA, right? Because in general, because the group does not commute, right? Uh, this operation, you multiply this by G and bring back G1 inverse, it will not get back you to G. G. You see, if it was abelian, then the product will just again be back to G, right? Because you can commute this. You can move the G1 inverse across if it commutes, and then G1 inverse G1 is 1, right? But if it's non abelian, it will not be. Okay? And SU2 in, in particular is non abelian, right? But what we are guaranteed is that whatever it is, it is going to be close to that entity. That is what, that's all we need. Hmm? It should be close to that entity. So I can again expand that. So it will be some 1 plus i y a times sigma a. Right? The result of this. So the, so the first term, of course, cancels. Right? G1 inverse G to the identity that cancels from here. So we, we are left with the statement that x a, uh, uh, G inverse of, uh, uh, let's call this, co this combination as x, okay, x, g, is some y. That this, uh, this combination I call y. And these are the elements of the Lie algebra. Okay. So this way, what we have done is that we have, we are giving a map from the Lie algebra to itself. Right? For every, sorry, this I was calling g1, okay, g1. Okay. Uh, so for any, g1 was arbitrary, right? For every G1, you can define an action which takes the Lie algebra to itself. So that's what. And that action is called a joint action. This, this action. So this, uh, yeah. So for every G, I can define an action on the X, on the Lie algebra, which takes you to the Lie algebra. Okay. And this action is called a joint. So let's now uh, explicitly let's work it out. I mean, this is, this is true, you see, for any Lie algebra, right? Here, of course, I didn't have to write it as I X A sigma A. I just call it X for any Lie algebra. It doesn't have to be SU2. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, this uh, reshuffling of elements for the whole group or only the algebra? The only, only the Lie No, the group, of course, at the group level, there will be no vector space structure, no? Uh, so, I mean, if you want to keep, you, of course, if this is this is defined inside the group, right? It's going to be some element, right? But, okay, fine, this is, uh, I mean, that you don't learn much more from that, no? But now what we are uh, trying to ask is that if this, can, this, if this is infinitesimal, then we have this argument is saying, basically, that this defines to you a map from the Lie algebra to itself. But G1 is not infinitesimally close to 1. Uh, another distant element from the... Ah, uh, G1 is arbitrary. G1 is arbitrary. It can be any... Uh, Could be any. Matrix from uh, the bigger SU2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could be any. Yeah, this G, this G1 need not be close. However, you can also ask the question, what happens if G1 was also close, right? That's interesting because then, uh, you see, so if you do this, if you do this, let's suppose G1 is, uh, G1 is also like identity plus some Z, okay? Where, uh, ignoring the higher orders in Z, right? Then G1 inverse is going to be identity minus Z to this order, right? Because G inverse times G should be identity. So if I'm only interested in the first order, the Z must cancel. So you, you see the Z cancel from the, because I, that's why I have a minus sign here. This is, or, or you should believe it only to the first order, right? Because uh, there are corrections, higher order corrections. But if I restrict to the first order, 
And this G is, again, identity plus X. Right? Then you see the, 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 uh, to the first, to the, uh, so, okay, identity you can forget because the ZZ cancels. But look at the first term, X. How does the X transform? X transforms, so what is the change here? So you get here minus Z times X, right? Times identity. Okay, that's the mode, that's a, to the first order in Z, right? Because I can't trust this calculation anywhere to a second order in Z. So, I, because there are also orders X squared, right? So I cannot uh, go into that. But uh, to the first order, I can trust this. So I keep that. But then I should take the, since I already taken one Z, I must take one from this G1. But then I can also take the other guy, I can take one from here, X from here, and Z from there, ZX. But that's the commutator. You see? That's the commutator. Indeed, I mean, so the commutator basically measures to what extent this group is non abelian if uh, if it was abelian of course we we know that this is going to be identity in the group, right so there will be nothing this commutator will be zero so the commutator is the so a joint action is here i have defined a joint action for any group element g1 is arbitrary but then if you restrict that to taking g1 also infinitesimal then that gives you a joint representation of the lie algebra right and what is special about this joint representation Unlike, let's say, the spin J representation of the SU2. SU2 itself was a spin 1 uh, object, right? I mean, there are three generators, there are spin 1. Hmm? Uh, but a representation could be anything, no? Could be any spin. But here, the, the, there's a action, there is a, a joint action of the Lie algebra, which acts on itself. You see, this is acting on itself, this commutator is acting on itself because the result of the commutator is again the element of the same Lie algebra. So it maps Lie algebra to itself. So, but okay, that we'll come, I mean, that is just a, but yeah, I think maybe to begin this, it's better to think in terms of the group element. Hmm? And then, okay, then one can restrict to the infinitesimal and then you get to the Lie algebra. Hmm? Oh, let's finish this part here. Okay. So, uh, so uh, now coming to the SU2, what we are seeing here is that uh, this G1 inverse G1, uh, okay, uh, any G, any G, acting on that will again be on X will give you some Y, right? So in particular, let me just take uh, sigma A itself. I mean, so sigma any, so only say one component is not zero. Okay. So that means that G1 inverse sigma A G1 should be uh, uh, some combination of sigma, sigma themselves, because th this is again is some combination of sigma, right? Mm -hmm. So let me call that, uh, uh, let me drop the subscript here, uh, sigma b, and it will be some linear combination, right? Uh, but the coefficients will, of course, depend on which a you started with, right? I mean, sigma 1 will give you one combination, sigma 2 <coughs> will give you another combination, sigma 3 will give you another combination. So to remember that, I put also this index A hmm, to indicate which sigma I started with. And this is a linear combination of sigma. Okay. So this, uh, this again, repeated index means some word. Okay. So it's going to be that. I mean, this is what it's telling you, that this uh, action is going to be of this. But Precisely what that coefficients will be, these coefficients will be, will also depend on G. Which group element you started with, right? I mean, different group elements will transform differently. Okay. So I also to remember that, I put here the G. So now, if you look at it, B runs from 1, 2, 3, A runs from 1, 2, 3. So this is a 3 by 3 matrix, right? A goes from 1, 2, 3, B goes from 1, 2, 3. So we have given a map from the group to three cross three matrices. Each, each group uh, element uh, G is mapped to a three cross three matrix. Okay. Now, uh, we can ask the question, is it a representation of the group in the way I defined before, whether the composition rule is satisfied? Okay. So let's suppose I, I ask to take another element, H, H inverse sigma A, 
h? Well, that's going to be some m a b, uh, but now it depends on h. I mean, it, it, uh, this symbol was simple to indicate which group element you started with. Hmm? Sigma b. Now I want to ask a question. What happens when I apply not g or h separately, but g times h? So let's suppose I want to ask the question, what happens if I apply gh times gh inverse? Where is this gh, of course, the compos group composition? Well, this is the same as h inverse, g inverse, sigma a, gh. But this guy, we already have said, this is the same. Ah, this by definition of this notation, in this notation, this by definition is M A B uh, of G H. G H is another element of the group, so right? Uh, 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 times sigma B, right? This by, by definition. But now I explicitly I open it up, so I get this here, and this is that. So therefore, this is the same as H inverse M A B G sigma B H. Okay? These are numbers. Okay. I can take that out. So the same as M A B G. And then you have H inverse sigma B H, but that here gives you M B C H sigma C. Okay. So indeed you see as, as a so let me also call this index. This is a dummy index, right? So I can call this C C. Nothing has changed. Then comparing these two you indeed see that M A C of G H is the same as M A B of G times M B C of H. But as a M as a matrix here, three by three matrix, three by three matrix, this is the ordinary matrix multiplication, right? So what we are saying is that as a matrix, if I write this just as a matrix, as a three by three matrix, this is the same as matrix of G times the matrix of H. Right? That was the definition of the, I mean, that's what I said, the, the representation is something, a map, which preserves the group composition too. Is, is that clear? Yeah, but uh, we, we may have been sigma, sigma A's and, and B's. I mean, we, we do the map in sigma roi here, and we, we take G to be uh, for each map a specific uh, a specific G specific matrix M. Right? I mean, uh, the, for the first statement, uh, what I use this was this argument, right? To say that the G inverse sigma A G is going to be some combination of sigma. Therefore, this combinations I, I wrote write it as M A B, right? The B because this is a sum, so there's a B sum, okay? Because this is going to be an element of the algebra, so it's going to be some combination of all the generators, right? That's that. Now here I put A and G to remember that if I had chosen a different A, I will get different numbers here, right? So I indicated that. So for each A, I have some numbers, and so I arrange them in a, like a matrix, a three by three matrix, because A goes from one to three, B goes from one to three. And G I write here because, again, these coefficients will depend on which G, right? So this way, by using this definition, I have given a map uh, from G to the three cross three matrices, where uh, where this little G is mapped to M G uh, as a three by three uh, matrix, right? Yeah, right? So sigma was going to use as a uh, intermediate step to obtain this map. Okay, but now I ask the question whether this map preserves the group composition rule, right? I see. Yeah. So that is what this discussion is about. Okay? And what we see that uh, indeed it, it satisfies. So it is a representation in the way we define the representation. It satisfies it. It preserves the group composition. Now it's a three by three matrix. Now can we say something more about it? Uh, so let's uh, try to, so what I want to know, uh, let me see how much, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, I think I should be able to finish this. Um, uh, I want to show, prove that uh, M, this matrix M, this 3 by 3 matrix, actually is a SO3 matrix. Okay. So, so let's uh, try to do that. Okay. 
So let's let's just take um, uh, this. Uh, uh, let's take uh, yeah. Um, so let's take g inverse sigma a g times. Um, let's see what I should do. Just one second. G inverse. Take the square of that. Actually, basically, you take the square sigma a and then g inverse sigma b g. So I take this here and take the product. This is, these are all matrices, right? I mean, I can, they are two by two matrices. Well, g, and so now open it up. G times g inverse is identity. Uh, so this is the same as g inverse uh, sigma a sigma b g. But sigma a sigma b, remember, was identity plus i uh, times delta a b plus i epsilon a b c sigma c. Right? So I substitute that here. This is identity. So g g g g g inverse will cancel. You can push the g through. So first term is simply delta a b times identity, and the second term is i epsilon a b c. These are numbers. So I can take that out, and then you have a g inverse sigma c g. Right? So g inverse sigma c g, which I rewrite as m. I mean, using the same rule, is just m c. Uh, d, let's say d, uh, sigma d. Right? On the other hand, I can also go through it different way. Each of them, I can replace by that rule. Right? Then I will find that this guy is m, say b, uh, e, sigma e. Uh, uh, let's call it f. And here I write it as m. A, this is G. This is the function. Sorry, I should have write written B. This is all, all for the same G. G here. And M, A, uh, something else. E, let's say, uh, sigma E. Product. As a matrix multiple. These are numbers, but that's a product. Sigma matrix product. So, so again, I can use the same kind of identity here. So the so you have M A E G, M B F G, and then you have sigma E times sigma F, but that is simply identity times delta E F plus I epsilon E F uh, something else, let's say K, sigma K. Okay. So you get an equation. Okay. Now, identity and sigmas are linearly independent matrices. The three poly matrices and the identity are linearly independent, right? Uh, I mean, already uh, the, this was a trace part, right? Identity was a trace part, and the three uh, sigmas were the uh, Hermitian uh, traces. So that those were the four bases for the Hermitian matrices, two by two matrices. So on this, so now you have this equation. So separately, the coefficient of identity must be equal because they are independent, right? As two by two matrices. And uh, also separately, the, each of the for each of the poly matrix, the coefficients must be equal, right? Otherwise, this equation will not be true. So if you take the identity guy, uh, what do we get here? Uh, so M A E, M A E, M uh, B F, delta E F. So which is the same as I can write E E. Uh, so these are both, everything is for the G, so I don't have to write it. This is for the same G. That's equal to delta AB. But that is nothing else, but it, it's just the M times M transpose AB. Right? That's equal to delta AB. So which means it's M times M transpose is identity. That means this matrix M is orthogonal. Okay. So that's the first statement. This orthogonal. So it's a first of all it's a three by three matrix and it's orthogonal, right? So it's certainly an element of O3, right? But now we want to check also the determinant is one.
So now let's look at the other components for each poly matrix. So now we have to equate for each poly matrix. So what do we get here? So this is sigma k. So what we have is uh, epsilon E F k. Uh, there's an i there, okay? i is on both sides, so I don't have to, I can forget about the i. Okay. And then uh, you have m a e and m b f. Okay, everything is g, so I don't have to write that. That's equal to uh, epsilon a b c. Uh, and uh, CD. So since I took sigma k here, so this should be, I should replace this by k, right? So MCK. That's the equation we have. So let us do the following. Let's multiply, this is equality, sorry, equality. Let's multiply both sides by MK something else, J, let's say. Mkj, multiply both sides of this equation by Mkj and sum over k. Okay. So multiply both sides. So you multiply both sides by that and sum over k. Now here, if you look at this, this is uh, sorry, what am I doing here? Kj. No, I, okay. Uh, I should write the other way on Mjk. Sorry, Mjk. And here is also mg, multiply by mg, and sum over k. Okay. Then I can use the first equation here, okay. because this is nothing else. Uh, mck mjk is the same as m m transpose cj, right? But m m transpose is identity. So uh, on this side, this simply becomes epsilon a b c times delta uh, cj. Okay, and what about this side? You see, this is nothing else but the determinant of the matrix M. Because you have epsilon E F K, E F K. So this quantity is nothing else but epsilon of the free index which are left over A, B, J times determinant of M. Is that clear? I mean, you know how determinant. Um, or not. I mean, in general, the determinant is given by a of a n by n matrix determinant. If I n is a n by n matrix, then determinant of m is defined like this. Um, determinant of m, uh, you can write it as um, uh, so. Determinant of m i one, i two, up to i n uh, is the same as. Uh, 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 Epsilon, uh, so what shall I call it? Yeah, J1, J2 up to Jn, M, I1, J1, I2, J2, etc., all the way up to M, I, N, J. This, this formula have you seen? I mean, uh, okay, if you look at this formula, uh, you can see, first of all, this is totally anti symmetric. Right? So look at, uh, this is going to be something which has index, free index i1, i2, i n, all the way up to i n. But since uh, these are totally anti-symmetric, I mean, if I exchange any of them, let's say if I exchange, okay, that means exchanging these two, right? I mean, if I exchange this, uh, sorry, I, that's the same as exchanging these two, but when I exchange, this is anti-symmetric. Exchanging these two, you can undo by exchanging i1, i2, right? But because it's a negative sign, that means this free, any two free indices, if you exchange the free indices, which are i1, i2 to im, you exchange, it'll give you a minus sign, right? So whatever, this is going to be some tensor of the type uh, which has a free index, free indices are this, right? Uh, the, this statement that exchanging any two ind indices, i1, i2, will pick up a minus sign. Is that argument clear? Suppose I exchange i1 and i2. So here I have m i2 j1 and m i1 j2. And remaining things I keep the same. I don't touch that. <coughs> but now I can relabel j1 and j2 
After all, these are Dabi indices. Yeah? I can call this J2, this J1, but then I have to call this guy J1 and that J2. Now, this is the same as that, because these are some numbers, right? Ordering, ordering doesn't matter. It's a multiplication of two numbers. So this part is the same. Only thing that has happened is that epsilon j1, j2 became epsilon j2, j1. But this I can exchange. I get a minus sign. Okay? So that shows that in this formula, if I exchange i1, i2, it will get back the same thing up to a minus sign. Right? And that's true for any pair. Why not just i1, i2, i2, i3, i4, i5, or i1, in, no? And the only tensor which has this property is the levi civita this, this is by definition, that's the levi civita right? This is something which is totally antisymmetric. In any pair exchange, is antisymmetric. OK? So, so this is, uh, this one, uh, yeah, so therefore, whatever it is, is proportional to that. Now, why the proportionality uh, constant is determinant of n? That you can check by explicitly how you define the determinant. I mean, think of, let's say, 3 by 3, say, take n equal to 3. So you have uh, m11, m12, m13, m21, m32, m23, m31, 32, 33. OK? So how will I calculate determinant? You, know, you usually open up, right, like that. So this times the determinant of that, okay? But that's going to be m11, m22, m33, minus m11, m23, m32. Now, what's the difference between the, this term and that term? It is just exchange of a pair in this, right? Here it was 2, 2, 3, 3. Now, what I did, this 2 is replaced by 3, and that 3 is replaced by 2, okay? And with a minus sign. So you already see one of the terms, which is, uh, I, I fix this 1, 1, then you have a 2, 2, 3, 3, minus 2, 3, 3, 2. And similarly, but you have other terms. Now you take m1, 2, then you have determinant of the, this, uh, whatever it's called, cofactor, I don't know what it's called. So this, you remove, delete that, and take the determinant of the remaining, right? <coughs> you see that in every term, every term, uh, this index, if I look at the index which comes, which, which uh, denotes a row, all the three indices appear, right? You will never have a situation where, where, where two, two of these indices are the same, right? So, because from each row, you pick only one element in this operation, right? One guy here, one guy here, one guy there. No? And similarly, from each column, you pick only one, one index, one, one element, right? So that is why all of these indices, the row indices, they are all different, okay? There is never an identical index. Similarly, the column indices will all be different. Right? And there are the signs. Like every time you exchange, there are the sign. Okay? That's why this is this object, nothing else will be determined. And if you are not convinced, you can try it out explicitly. You know, take a three by three matrix and then just work it out. There are how many terms are there? Not too many. Not many. One, two, three. Six terms, right? That's not a big deal. You can explicitly check. Yeah? Okay. So that's the thing. So therefore, what we, are, uh, what we said, yeah, what I did, this was the equation I got by, which I erased, by looking at the sigma term on the two sides. Hmm? This was the equation. So of course, there's a free index here. Uh, e, uh, uh, the, there are free index uh, sigma c, for each c, right? I think I changed the say c. I don't know. Yeah, c is here. So c is here, OK? Uh, actually, I call it k, k, sigma k. This was multiplying sigma k, both sides. And I just equated them because sigmas are linearly independent. So each coefficient has to be equal on the two sides. Huh? So I get this equation. Now, I don't need the details of all this equation. I only need to check the determinant is 1. Okay? Because this already told me that this is orthogonal. So I just want to check whether the determinant is 1 or not. And that comes by, that, that you can obtain by just multiplying this equation by m, j, k, k is this index, k, and sum over k. If you do that, this guy is proportional to delta, uh, this was r, c, delta c, j, okay? And then epsilon a, b, so this becomes epsilon a, b, j, uh, left hand side. Right hand side, this, this object, by using that formula, um, 
it's, it's a three by three matrix, so this index, there are uh, Levi-Civita tensor required is a three index Levi-Civita. And uh, you see that EFK, so these are the three index EFK, and then ABC, no, EFK is some lower, and ABJ are the three indices, okay? So from that formula, this is equal to epsilon ABJ, totally anti-symmetric, times the determinant of M. Now compare the two sides. This is delta Cj times epsilon, so that makes it ABJ times 1. Okay. So this is the equal, so that tells me determinant of x1. So, so that's the problem. So it is quite interesting, you see. So what we did, we just uh, start, started from the adjoint action of SU2 on the SU2 Lie algebra. Okay. So that guaranteed that G inverse sigma G should be some linear combination of sigma. Now, those from those, those linear combination, coefficients of those combinations, we constructed the matrices, 3 by 3 matrices. Okay? And amazingly, those 3 by 3 matrices turn out to be SO3 matrices. Okay? This is the, uh, yeah. Okay. But, so th this gives you a map. Map from the SU, th this uh, amazingly, this odd procedure that gives a map between the SU2 group to SO3. Because mm -hmm. this is the group level now. Because huh? this uh, G is a group, finite group element. These Gs are finite group element, not the Lie algebra. Huh? And what we have shown is that this is a, N, this matrix is a matrix which defines the SO3 group, not the Lie algebra group. Huh? So this gives you a map. So when we say G, so this gives you a map from G to SO3. So SU2 to SO3. SU2 group to SO3 group. Where I have the G here, and here I call the matrices as M. And this G is mapped to the M of G. Right? But you can ask, is this map one to one? Right? That was one of the things we were asking before when we discussed. Is it, are the groups exactly the same? No, or is not? Answer is not because this map was defined as G inverse. Uh, uh, I mean, this was this matrix was defined as uh, G inverse sigma A G is equal to M A B G sigma D. This was a defining equation, right? Uh, this completely fixed M A B. I have no freedom. But now, if I instead of G, if I had taken minus G which is also an element of SU2, remember. Right? Because if G is unitary, minus G is also unitary. And determinant of G is 1, then minus G is also 1, because there's 2 by 2 matrices. So you'll get a minus 1. When you take determinant, you'll get minus 1 square, which is 1. So G and minus G both are elements of the SU2. They're different elements. You see, they're not the same elements. Right? Take, for example, identity. Identity element is this, 1, 0, 0, 1. This is the identity of SU2. But you have also element minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1. This is also an SU2 element. This is not the same. Two different matrices. Um, this is a, yeah, OK, I'll make some comment about that. Uh, but here, if I replace G by minus G, nothing happens, because this also is minus, 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 plus. Right? So that tells you that it is not a one-to-one -one map. Okay. So. G and minus G both are mapped to the same SO3 element. This is a two to one map. Okay, two elements are mapped to one element. Uh, yeah, maybe no, I don't have. Uh, maybe next week I'll uh, go through this in a little bit more, uh, uh, in a way that it makes it more clear. In what? Why is it this two by two? Yeah. In this problem, uh, all these because when we add joints, we always multiply from left and right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for any uh, group, uh, a joint representation is kind of a double. Uh, uh, double, uh, yeah, it, uh, hmm. it will not be. Because as you see, uh, the minus G was a uh, particular case, right? Because uh, we had two conditions for the G. Uh, the G, G dagger G was one. But that's OK. If I take minus here, minus here, nothing changes with that. I mean, this was a unitarity condition, right? But we also had the condition did G is equal to 1, right? Now, the reason why this minus didn't matter 
was that this G were two by two matrices. Space also, it's not, it is not a, not a Take for example SU3. Take SU3. This they're not three by three matrices, right? Unitary matrices. So this equation will not change if I put minus, but this equation will change because it's a three by three matrix, right? So in SU3, this will not be true. Hmm? Um, of course, SU3 will not be mapped to a, a SO3, of course, right? I mean, it will be something more complicated, right? But I'm just saying that this minus will not be automatically there. However, something else will be there. Um, that is, uh, 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 in general, I mean, you see, uh, if I take, uh, there's an element in SU3, SU3, uh, which is of this type, one, uh, omega, omega square. This I'm talking about SU3 now. So this is SU3. Uh, where omega is a third root of unity. Okay, so let's say e to the two pi i over three. Okay. This is perfectly okay. The determinant is uh, one. Okay, because omega cube is one. So, or, or, or more generally, yeah. In fact, you can take this element, uh, omega, 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 omega. It's proportional to identity. Actually, this is even uh, more striking. This is a more striking example because. Uh, this is identity, right? That means this element commutes with every group, I mean, proportional to identity, right? So this commutes with all the elements of SU3. Okay? So an element which commutes with all the elements of, uh, so if you consider the set of all the elements of a group, which commutes with every element of the or given original group, that is called, that itself is a group, you can show it, that is, itself is a group, and it's called the center of the group, okay? So in the case of SU2, the center of the group consists of these two elements. That's the center of the group for SU2. This commutes, is again proportional identity. It commutes with everything. In SU3, in SU3 case, you have identity, this, and square of this. Three elements. They, they are proportional to identity, and they satisfy determinant equal to one. You see, determinant here is omega, 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 product, omega cube. Omega cube is one. Right? So for SU3, the center is uh, three elements, one omega or another square, so it's a Z3, Z3. You know, remember the two pi by, e to the two pi by n, two pi by three, Z3. More generally for SUN, it will be ZN. Uh, the center of the groups play an important role in representation here. But uh, for, I mean, not probably for this course, but it, it's a way to classify uh, different types of representations, but, but okay. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, here, uh, for example, uh, here, uh, this, uh, in a C2 case, what happens is that you'll find there will be spin J representations, I mean, this I'm going ahead, spin J, where J can be either half integer or integer. J could be also half integer. In SO3, you cannot. In SO3, you will only have integer spins. But here, in SU2, you have also half integer spins. And what's the difference between those two? This action, this element, when it acts on the half spin, spin half, or n plus half, spin half, spin three half, represent etc., it takes a value minus one. On this, even on the integer spin, it will take value plus one. The way it acts on the representation. So this is a way of classifying different representations. So the certain class of representation have some eigenvalue with respect to this center, or another class will have a different eigenvalue, etc. So they play an important role. But here it is just simply this statement that because it's e even two by two matrix minus G exists, yeah. so it's a two to one number. I mean, so far we, we have not shown it's two to one, but at least two to one. At least it's two to one. Right? Okay. So I think uh, let's stop now and. Um, then we continue. I mean, I, I was hoping to finish this chapter completely, but I will, I will take about half an hour next week. And then, uh, good thing. Thanks, sir. Eh?